is where we left off, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, last time we were talking about the different kinds of bacteria. And so we have the archaeobacteria, which is the ancient bacteria, and then we have the U bacteria, which are the true bacteria. Um, you guys remember uh, what are bacteria, prokaryotic or eukaryotic? That's right. The, so, do they have a nucleus? No. So, because that's what prokaryote means. And then, what are we? Prokaryotes or eukaryotes? We're eukaryotes, right? Because we have a nucleus. So, there's a difference between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells besides the basics. All bacteria are prokaryotes. Everything else besides bacteria are eukaryotes. It's pretty simple. Um, and remember, there's two different kinds of bacteria, the archaeobacteria and the eubacteria. So, eukaryotic cells are big compared to prokaryotes. Um, here's an image of one, so you can see right here. This is the eukaryote. How do I know that this is the eukaryotic cell back here? Yeah, it has a nucleus, which is shown right here. The nucleus of the eukaryote is bigger than the whole prokaryotic cell. Right, so, this is huge by comparison. Um, the eukaryotic cell has a nucleus, which is a specialized, what we call an organelle. So all cells have a cell membrane that's made out of lipids, actually phospholipids, so it's a thin layer of fats. It's about uh, one ten thousandth the thickness of a sheet of notebook paper. Right, so it's pretty thin. Uh, some organisms have a cell wall, which is made out of cellulose, which you guys call, you know what that's called on your nutritional label? If you're reading like the back of a box of cereal or whatever, what's cellulose called? Fiber. Yeah, it's fiber. It's exactly right. So it's non-digestible. Uh, sugar because it ends in an OFC. Uh, so all bacteria have a cell wall. So all prokaryotes have a cell wall. Some eukaryotes have a cell wall. Like we don't, but plants do. Some fungi do. Uh, so you may or may not have a cell wall. All eukaryotes have organelles. One of those is a nucleus. The nucleus houses DNA, right? which is our instruction book. This membrane is made up of phospholipid bilayer too. Are we talking about the lysosome in here? All right, that must have been my other class. So one of the organelles, one of the functions of these organelles is that they set up specialized compartments. This one houses DNA, right? This one is called the lysosome. And it's important for digestion. So how do you guys digest your food? Okay. That's it. We're as simple as that, right? So what is an acid? I mean, that's important for you to be able to digest stuff, right? Your stomach is acidic. So what's the definition of an acid? Do you guys know? You will, because we're going to cover it in chapter three. But an acid is defined as uh, the level of hydrogen ions in a solution, right? And we're going to learn about that in chemistry. But you call it a very common term. How do we measure the, how uh, acidic something is? pH, right? pH literally comes from the French word process hydrogen, which means power of hydrogen. So that's what pH, when every time you say pH, didn't know that before, did you? Power of hydrogen, that's what you're saying. So the cell's pH is between 7.2 and 7.6. And we talked about that this is important to maintain homeostasis, right? Because if the pH changes, then the shape of the proteins change, and that would be bad. But in the lysosome, this pH is about 5. Right? What do you think that is? Yeah, digest stuff, right? So like a white blood cell is cruising along and it runs into a bacteria and it says, hey bacteria, I'm gonna eat you. And it 
takes out, it puts out these false feet and it pulls in the bacteria, right? So it's just invited the bacteria inside its home to hang out. Hey, you want to watch the TV and hang out inside my cell? No, it has to get rid of that thing, right? So it shoves it into the lysosome where just like if you ate it, it would get digested and it gets chopped up into pieces and those pieces get recycled into the white blood cell. So the lysosome has to have a, more, a lower pH because it's more acidic to do that sort of work. Um, but if it didn't have a, if there wasn't a membrane around that, could that maintain a pH of 5.0 with the rest of the cell being 7.2 to 7.6? So organelles have a specialized function. Prokaryotes do not have organelles, right? So they can't, they don't, they're not able to do specialized functions like eukaryotic cells. The outside part of this where the organelles aren't found is called the cytoplasm. Sometimes it's called the cytosol. Plasm, just like you know, in Ghostbusters or whatever, the 30th anniversary is out in the movie theater now. And so it's just kind of a goo, right? So cyto means cell and plasm means goo. So it's the cytoplasm is the cellular goo. It's inside your cell are dissolved like salts and sugars, you know, like it's sort of the consistency of like corn syrup. You guys have seen Cairo syrup or you know, pancake syrup. That's what it is. Um, and it's because you have all these proteins and stuff dissolved in here to do all of the things that are required for life. And sol is short for solvent, so cyto solvent, because this stuff is in solution. All right, um, any questions about that? All right, so I might ask you on the test, uh, what's, what is an organelle for? Well, that's for the lysosome, but what are organelles for? They set up specialized compartments to do special reactions or, you know, special pHs or whatever. Where, who has organelles, prokaryotes or eukaryotes? Or neither or both? Right? Yeah, do prokaryotes have organelles? Do prokaryotes have cell walls? They all do, right? Without exception. What about eukaryotes? Some do, right? So plants do, some fungi, we don't, but we're still a eukaryote. So all prokaryotes have cell walls, some eukaryotes have cell walls. Okay. So prokaryotes are small, right? There's no nucleus, so the DNA is just in the cytoplasm, right? It's just out there. No organelles, no special organelles in prokaryotes at all. Right, so we're gonna we're gonna cover all the organelles when we get to chapter six, which is tour of the cell. But for right now, I just want you to know the basics. Chapter one is just kind of an overview to let you know what you're getting yourself into, so you can bail before the drop date. Just um, but it basically, yeah, it's a, it's a it's an overview of what we're gonna go over. So without getting into too much detail, I'm just gonna give you the basics. But we'll go into all of this stuff in great detail in each of the chapters. And that's a good question. There's lots of different organelles, and there are lots of specialties that they functions that each one of those perform. And we'll talk about every single one of those when we get into chapter six. All right. So, all prokaryotic cells. I put almost because there's always an exception to the rule, right? If I sit up here and said there's no prokaryote that doesn't have a cell wall, you know, and somebody discovered it, and you guys would be like, that Dr. Over Miller is such a liar, right? So there's, this is science, and we're talking about millions of millions of different species. So anytime I say something, there's always an exception, right? Well, there's probably going to be an exception. So, but without committing myself, I can safely say that we don't know of any uh, prokaryotes that don't have a cell wall currently. Uh, but regardless of what their size are, the cell is the smallest unit that can perform all of the things that we define is required for life. Do you guys remember what those are? Homeostasis. Homeostasis. What's that mean? Maintaining the environment. 
Right. Maintaining a relatively constant internal environment. What else? Growth. Growth. Reproduction. Reproduction. Order. Right. So make sure you guys know those because I can easily ask you that on a test. I'll, you're going to have to pick it up out of a lineup because it's, it's a multiple choice test. But as long as you can identify them, you're good to go because it's important that we be able to define life. Right, so some eukaryotes have cell walls, others don't. And usually they're defined by what kingdom they're in, and we're going to talk about taxonomy in a second. All right, so the, all of our information, our heritable information is found in DNA, right? DNA is an instruction book. It's found in the nucleus. It doesn't do anything. It's like a cookbook. Your cookbook doesn't make you dinner, right? You have to read and use the cookbook and follow the recipe. Believe it or not, even though you have all this information and all these instruction books, you are proteins. That's what makes you what you are. Right? It's not the DNA, uh, it's the proteins. And so the DNA is just the recipe book. Uh, the instructions for all life is encoded in DNA, but DNA does not perform any function. The, uh, the area, the DNA itself is composed of four letters. Those are A, G, C, and E. Uh, we use letters for the English alphabet, right? How many letters do we have in the alphabet? 26, right? And so, you, can we only make 26 words? How do we make different words? Different combinations, right? Same thing here. So, to a cell, I mean, you might not be able to read this, right? This may be Greek to you or Latin, you know, or, I mean, it, may, it could be very well be Egyptian hieroglyphics. But it means something to the cell, right? The cell can read this, and it can, and this tells it, you know, make a hair color protein, right? Make hemoglobin that's going to carry oxygen and so on and so forth. So it's the order of these letters. that tell it to make something different. Does that make sense to everyone? So that's the instruction set. It's no different than the English language. Right? It's almost the same, except it's four letters instead of 26. The sentences or paragraphs or whatever you want to call them, we call those genes, right? It's the defined area that, that codes for a specific protein. So you guys have lots of different genes. We know of at least 30,000 different genes in the human body human genome that make you what you are. So you have genes that code for the, you know, connective tissue in your skin, collagen, uh, fibronectin. You have genes that code for the color, the pigments that are put in your eye. We know of three different genes that code for human skin color, right? So the more of those genes you have, guess what? The darker your skin is. Um, there are genes, you know, for everything, every protein that's made, right? We, I told you guys that you eat food and you breathe air, and that turned into ATP. There's a series of genes that their job is solely to convert the food energy into that chemical energy of ATP. So that's what a gene is. And you pass on your genes to your offspring. Sometimes those genes are uh, broken, so we call that mutation. Does that make sense? So, this is a DNA molecule. It's a double helix. That means it has, it's like a ladder and it has uh, two sides of it, and in between it has rungs. Those rungs are the letters. Um, and in DNA, the letters always have complementary pairs. So, if uh, one side of the ladder is an A, the other side is a T. If one side of the ladder is a G, the other is a C. And that doesn't vary at all. So this one here is an A, what's on the other side? This one's a C, what's over here? Yeah, so you can always safely assume that that's what it is. This is what we call a space filling model. So each of these show the atoms and their electrical orbitals, their electron orbitals. So this, if you could shrink yourself down, this is what it would look like to you, right? the size of an atom. This is what your DNA 
like I said, it's the order of the the building blocks we call nucleotides. So those A's and G's and C's and T's are called nucleotides. When we get to chapter five, I'll show you exactly what makes a nucleotide. But for right now, just remember, it's the building blocks, the letters, and DNA. All right. So all living things use the same genetic code. And I think I showed you guys the glowfish and all that other stuff. So you know that we can take one gene from any organism and put it in any other organism, and it reads it just like if it was its own. That It's like if everyone on Earth used the exact same language, we could all communicate with each other, no problem, right? I, you know, if I went to Greece, I wouldn't have to worry about someone speaking English to me because I know that they would. I would understand <coughs> it. That's how it is in biology. So we can take genes, you know, from jellyfish and stick it into zebrafish and make them glow. Um, you know, we, t th we talked about knocking out genes, the myostatin gene in here. I don't think we did. So, you know, we can take a gene that makes human insulin and put it in a bacteria. And, you know, people can take that as an insulin. Um, so we can add genes, you know, probably you guys heard of genetically modified crops and genetically modified organisms. So those are uh, plants that have genes from, you know, bacteria that make them resistant to in certain insects or, you know, that are resistant to Roundup, which you guys know you can spray on your weeds and it kills them. So we can add genes to things and we can also take genes away. So there's a gene called myostatin. Uh, and, and higher level organisms that use muscular system, a skeletal muscular system, they, uh, your muscle requires a lot more energy to maintain than say not having muscle. So this gene controls whether or not muscle is being maintained, right? Myostatin's job is to inhibit muscle growth. So the standard state is that you don't have muscles, right? Or you just have enough that you need to exist. If the gene's mutated, then there's nothing to suppress muscle growth, right? So if we took myostatin away, you end up with cows, right? So here's a cow that this particular cow doesn't have the myostatin gene, so its muscle growth is unchecked. Um, here's a dog. So this has a myostatin gene mutation. Um, here's a here's a mouse. So this is a normal mouse. This is one that has a mutation. These are actually uh, from the same mother, right, in the same litter. This one has got that gene knocked out. This mouse didn't work out or anything like that, right? Uh, you know what its name is? It's the first myostatin defective mouse. You know what they called it? Mighty Mouse. Mighty Mouse. That's exactly they did. Uh, this is what their muscles look like. So this is a standard mouse, this is the one that's defective in myostatin. So, not only can we add genes into organisms, but we can take them out as well. So long term, what is the effect of that? I mean, could I see that there were humans that have that too? So, that, so, a lot of those are just, I mean, it's the internet, right? So anybody can post whatever they want. There's only one documented case of a human that's ever had this defect. It's a child that lives in Germany. They're, a, you know, this was a about three years ago, so I'm guessing they're about six now. So, but you can believe that people are watching this to try to figure out if there's any sort of uh, side effects of having this mutation. So as far as we know, that it, that doesn't have any effect on those organisms. Right. I mean, you know, steaks are made out of muscle. So, 
you know, it's to the benefit of the farmers or whatever to have cows that have a lot of steak on them, right? It's to the benefit of the farmer to have corn crops that are resistant to corn borers. You know, and, and we can also add genes. Do you guys know that 3 million children every year uh, go blind because of vitamin A deficiency worldwide? It's a vitamin A, right? We take it for granted here, but in third world countries, they don't have that. So scientists decided to take genes that synthesize vitamin A and put it into the most common grain crop that there is. Do you know what that is? It's rice, right? So the, it's called golden rice because it has a yellow color because it has vitamin A in it. But that has five different genes that synthesize vitamin A. Right? So, you know, it could do good, right? A lot of people are afraid of it. But regardless, because everyone uses the same code, bacteria, people, zebrafish, mice, uh, we can transfer genes from one organism to another pretty readily. So uh, the diversity of life is generated by different uh, levels of gene expression, right? If the genes turned on or off, and we talked about that. You guys know that all you all came from a single fertilized egg, and all of the cells that came from that has the exact same DNA. And the reason that your brain cell is different than your heart cell is because the genes are expressed differently. What came first, the chicken or the egg? So, uh, yeah, no, I know, I, I, that's why I, was, I said that. All right, so uh, one thing that we're going to talk about in here is the human genome. So the, do you guys know what a genome is? It's on your crossword puzzle. So a genome is a complete genetic instruction set for an organism. The human genome contains 3.15 billion letters, A's and G's and C's and T's in various orders. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, if it was your biology text, it would be about the size of a 25 to 30 story building. Um, so that's a massive amount of information that fits inside every single cell in the nucleus. Um, and so the first human genome project cost the federal government $12 billion to sequence the first human 15 years ago. Today, you can have, everyone in here could have their genome sequenced for $10,000. Right. How many people have the $10,000 to sequence their genome? Not a lot. What would be the advantage of sequencing your genome? Well, they, they don't sequence the genome because it would be really expensive, but they do do specific to genetic tests. Sure. So, yeah, so you could find out, you know, if you were predisposed to breast cancer, right? Because you probably know there's a breast cancer gene or prostate cancer or, you know, but what's really cool about this is that, you know, let's say that you, let's say that you were depressed and you went to the doctor and you asked for, you know, antidepressant, you know, medication like Zoloft or Prozac or something like that. So the doctor doesn't really know what's going to work on you. So now all of a sudden you become a human guinea pig, right? They write you a prescription and you take it. It takes a while for it to build up in your system. So you could take it for a month, right? And then find out, hey, it uh, doesn't work. So then what do they do? Let's try another one, right? And that doesn't work. And then what do you do? By then you're really extra depressed because you can't find anything that actually helps with your depression. So, you know, that's pretty lame. But, you know, if you they, the doctor had your genome, they would know exactly what worked on you. Right? Not only that, but like, uh, let's say that you had a, a, a coronary artery that was blocked. Do you guys know what they do generally about that? Right, so they put in a catheter or a stent. Um, and that, so basically it's a metal sheath, sometimes it's plastic, but regardless of what it's made out of, its job is to simply open up that artery. Right? But your body doesn't like foreign objects in it. So what does it want to do when you have that thing inserted? 
Right, it wants to grow scar tissue on it, which will cause it to close back up. So do you know what they do to prevent that? Yeah, they use blood thinners like warfarin. Yeah, so the, this blood, yeah, that's exactly right. It's a, it's a rat poison at a small dose. It's small enough that it doesn't kill you, but it will thin your blood. It only comes at two doses. Right? Do you think that there's only two kinds of people that would take two, you know, two different doses of this medication? What happens if you get too much of it? Right, you could trip and fall and get a ble and bleed to death. Right? What if you don't get enough? You can clot. Yeah, so your your coronary arteries could close back up, right? And then you you just paid your cardiologist eighty thousand dollars for no reason for their five hour operation um, <laughs> so what do you how would you how would you know some people's bodies break down drugs faster than others right we have different enzymes that do that so how would you know how much to give somebody you I mean but you know you wouldn't know exactly what makes you different than me without looking at the, well you could know from DNA right because the DNA is the master set of instructions that make the enzymes. So if you had your whole genome, then you could tell, you know, you could go to the doctor and they could tell exactly how much of a medication that you would need, right? And now all of a sudden, medicine's changed because when you guys go to the pharmacy, the doctor writes you a prescription and they give you a, sp a pill, right? The pharmacist basically opens up a bottle and dispenses out, you know, 30 tablets of you know whatever milligram it is but at some point everyone's going to have their own dna sequence you know it's going to get cheap enough where we can do that and then if how medicine becomes what we call personalized it's going to be tailored to you so you're going to go to your doctor and you're going to show him what your dna looks like and he's going to know how fast you break down this drug and then they're going to prescribe a specific amount it's not going to be 10 milligrams, it's going to be 11.2. And then the pharmacist is going to actually have to make it up right there. It's not going to be where you just, you know, open bottles and dispense things anymore. It's every person is going to have medicine custom tailored to them because we're all unique, because we're, all of our DNA is different. But other things could happen too, right? What if... What if the insurance company finds out that you're predisposed to, you know, heart disease or whatever? What about employers? What if you were, you know, what if you were getting hired onto a company, all these companies have to pay health insurance premiums, right? Would they discriminate against you if they knew that you were going to, you had a 90% chance of having a cardiovascular event in the next 10 years? Sure, they got a stack of resumes and they look it up and they go, oh, we'll just move that guy to the bottom of the pile, right? So, you know, legally it may not happen, but, you know, when the, I mean, this is going to happen. It's, you, we'll probably see it in our lifetimes and then we're going to have to deal with a whole mess of other uh, things that go along with it. All right, so reductionism versus holism. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but there's basically two things in biology. Uh, reductionist uh, basically is someone that says, I can understand how an organism works by studying all of its parts. And a holist would say, no, you can't, because you have to look at the whole organism and see how it interacts with this environment. Okay? So basically, uh, you could equate it to uh, having a parts list for a Boeing 747. I think there's you know, 100,000 parts that go into that plane. If you, if I gave you the parts list, list, would you know how the plane flew? Does that tell you how the plane flies? No, but it's a good start, right? So same thing here. You know, just because we know the parts list of a human or a frog or whatever, doesn't mean that we know how it thinks or how it functions. So in this class, our job is to look at the parts and then later on, when you take other classes, you'll get to look at how those organisms interact with their environment. All right, so we're going to be reductionist for a semester. 
Any questions so far? All right, so I'm going to skip this slide because that's just what I said. All right, we're open systems. So organisms are open systems, and that's important. We're going to talk more about this when we talk about energy utilization. But you know that you're an open system, right? I mean, where do you get your energy from? Do you make it yourself? If I put you in a box, would you survive? Why not? You need food and water. Where do you get that from? External sources. So you're an open system. Where do we get our energy ultimately from? The sun, right? The sun. If the sun burned out, plants wouldn't be able to photosynthesize. They wouldn't be able to make carbohydrates. And we wouldn't be able to function because we rely on them for our energy. So sunlight is the ultimate energy source. And, you know, what we do to our environment affects the way that we can process this energy. Right? Um, so we talk about the ecosystem. It's how we interact with our environment. Basically, we have sunlight that produces energy, uh, or the producers convert that energy. Plants are producers. They produce sugars carbohydrates. Uh, as a biologist, I would argue that that's not true. Uh, carbohydrate is not a word for sugar. It's actually, do you guys know what the word for sugars for carbohydrates is? It's amylose, right? I don't know where carbs came into the factor, but all sugars end in OSE, right? What's the, I mean, you guys know this, what's uh, fructose? It's the stuff that you're not, they're not supposed to put in your food. And what's a table sugar? So it's sucrose, which is glucose. One, it's a disaccharide. And then lactose and milk, right? Fructose is fruits, um, and so on and so forth. So all sugars and then OSE, except carbohydrate. Does that end in OSE? Yeah, so, so the correct term for carbohydrate is amylose. But you go and ask somebody, hey, are you on the, that low amylose diet? And they're like, what the hell is this? So plants do photosynthesis. They produce amylose, which you call carbohydrates, and I'll allow that since you're used to it. Um, some of that energy is lost as heat, but the main goal is to convert that energy into the energy of chemical bonds. So inter this energy conversion is really important. We call it metabolism. There's two kinds of energy. There's kinetic energy and potential energy. So kinetic comes from the Greek word kinetikos, which means moving. So kinetic energy is energy in motion. Potential energy is energy that's stored for later use. If that makes sense, right? Potential. So what kind of energy do you think sunlight is? Kinetic or potential? Kinetic. Why? Because it it's in the form the form of light, right? And it comes from the sun, so it had to move from the sun to here. So it's an energy in motion. What about heat energy? What kind of energy is that? Potential or kinetic? The answer is kinetic. Uh, kinetic. Kinetic. <laughs> Yeah, not the state. Um, boy, I've been teaching all day. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so uh, heat is the energy in molecules moving, and and we'll talk about what heat is later in in chapter three when we talk about water. Um, what about the energy in chemical bonds, like the energy in, say, gasoline. What kind of energy is that? Kinetic or potential? It's potential, right? What about the energy in the, your food, like your carbohydrates or your fats or your proteins? It's all potential, right? So chemical energy is potential energy. And so basically what plants do is they convert kinetic energy into potential energy so that it can be stored and used later which is pretty cool, right? Because heat energy is just energy that's lost. It can't be stored. Kinetic energy is the same. Right. 
Any questions about that so far? All right, so the next thing that we're gonna talk about is taxonomy. Taxonomy is basically a way of naming and classifying organisms into groups based on how they're related or how they appear to one, uh, related to one another. So the taxonomic system categorizes living systems. It was developed by Carolyn, Le Carolyn Linnaeus uh, in the 1700s. And basically it groups things into uh, broad groups and then it, they become more specific. So the broadest groups are the kingdoms. There's five kingdoms. Your book actually talks about a six or a seven kingdom system, but actually it it's, it, it's a, puts things in domains. So the five kingdom system is the Monera, include all the prokaryotes. So what are those? What are all the prokaryotes called collectively? Bacteria, right? So the Monerans are the bacteria. And we'll do a lab where you guys will grow bacteria off of different body parts and stuff. Um, I'm probably going to have my lab do that this week and switch the chemistry one. You guys that did the lab today, did you do the chemistry lab? Did you have any idea what you were doing? That's what I thought. So that's why I want to switch it. Because we haven't even got to that unit yet. Right? So basically it's just putting a bunch of sticks and balls together, which doesn't make any sense to do right away. But I'm not the instructor for 181, so it's not my fault that the lab schedule is the way it is. He's the one that made it up. I'm, I'm going to switch it for my class. Anyway, so the Kingdom Monera, then we have the protist, and you guys are going to look at the protist. They're actually single-celled eukaryotes, so they're not bacteria. Um, and then uh, the next one is the plants, so that's a Kingdom Plantae, and then uh, fungus, right, mushrooms and things like that, that's in the Kingdom Fungi, and then the fifth one is the Kingdom that we're in, do you guys know what that ca is called? animals, right? Animalia. So, and then it gets more specific. So I'll, I'll show you guys what this is, but you'll definitely need to know this. You'll need to memorize this. When I was in high school, I learned that this King Phil came over for good spaghetti. And then whenever I took this at University of Texas, my biology teacher made it less PG and more R and it became spaghetti became sex. Right? So King Phil here. <laughs> but however you remember it, it doesn't matter as long as you remember that's the order that it comes in. Because I guarantee you that you'll see a test question that's going to ask you, what are the groupings from most general to most specific? And so you'll need to be able to at least pick it up, you know, pick it out of a lineup. So I'll write them down. So Monera, this is the bacteria. And then Protist. These are single cell eukaryotes. And so, do these have a nucleus? Do protists have a nucleus? Do they have a organelles? So, all eukaryotes have organelles, right? Do Monera have organelles? No. Right, so these are the kind of questions that you might expect. Then, the next one is the fungi which is the fungus, mushrooms, uh, molds, and that includes like slime molds and things like that. And then, so this is one, two, three, four. The next one is the, the things that do photosynthesis. <laughs> Specialized sense organs like eyes and ears and things like that.
things like that. Um, and generally, they're they're able to move where plants aren't. There. We call this sessile, and we call it these mobile. I'll give you guys a list of the different characteristics each of these have. So, they, like you know, one of the questions I might ask you on the test is, you went to Europa. We talked about that, right? And you found an organism that had these certain characteristics. How would you classify it? And so you have to use what you know to put it into one of the kingdoms. Was there a question over here? Yeah, so this is just kingdoms. Yeah, those are the five kingdoms. Some books have six kingdoms. I've seen books that have nine kingdoms. I figure five is enough to, to, for you guys to know, so we don't have to get any more complicated than that. And then just make sure you know this is the order. Because I will ask you this, I promise. All right, so here's some examples from anim the animal kingdom. So all of these are in which kingdom? Animalia, good. And so that means that they have specialized sense organs and they can move and stuff like that. So we look at humans, chimpanzees, house cats, lions, and house flies. So they're all in the kingdom Animalia, right? The phylum, humans, chimpanzees, House cats and lions are all in the phylum chordate, which basically means that they have a spinal cord. Housefly has no backbone. Right. In fact, when I first went to ASU to graduate school, they wanted me to work on fruit flies, and I told them I will not work on anything that does not have a vertebrate. And so I ended up working on eels instead, which really wasn't my second choice, but. Sometimes you you got to take what they give you. So these have spinal cords. This is Arthropoda, does not. Class, these are the classes mammal. You guys know what mammals are, right? They have fur. Uh, generally, unless it's that weird platypus thing, they give live birth, you know. Uh, they uh, use mammary glands to produce milk to nurse their young. This is a in the class insecta or insect. Order primates, so we're both chimpanzees and humans are primates. House cats and lions are in a different order. They're carnivorous, right, because they're carnivorous. Uh, this is Dioptera. Um, th this just means that it has uh, two pairs of wings. One is vestigial, so it's not used. So that's why it's in that die, right? Die means two. You guys know that? Anyway, is it, you don't have to know all this stuff. The reason I'm showing you this is so that you can see how things are related, how we use the classification system to, to describe things that are related to each other. So humans, chimpanzees, they vary here in their family, but house cats and lions, they're in the same family. In fact, they're in the same genus. We're not. So what do you think is more closely related? Humans and chimpanzees, or lions and house cats? And you'd be right. All right? Um, and then here's the species. So our genus is Homo, species is sapien. Almost everybody knows that. Uh, so our scientific name is Homo sapiens. Right? This is written in a specific way. The first letter of the genus is always capitalized. The first letter of the species is always lowercase. And then it's always either underlined or in italics. Right, that's the rule. This may be way forward uh, or in advance. Um, were there other species of humans before? I mean, I read a book that they were like, you know, there was there's Homo sapiens, which are what we are now, but before there was like the Hobbit or the, you know. Yeah, Habilius and, and yeah, and Homo erectus, and yeah, there's lots of different. Uh, species that scientists have classified and them are, in. Is the Homo sapien just a mashup of all of those? No, so it's a, it's different. It's unique. It has certain unique pro uh, properties that allow it to have a, its own species classification. General biologists refer to as a species as something that uh, can, a population that can interbreed and produce viable offspring. So like a lion and a tiger, those are two different species because if they breed, what do they make? A liger, but then they're sterile, so they can't produce offspring. 
So that's why they're considered unique species. Okay? Same thing with like a donkey and a yeah. Right. So yeah. So I mean, if you look at evolution, you know, there's there's variation in skull shape. But we're you know, could Homo erectus breed with Homo sapiens? We'll never know because they never lived at the same time. Right. We know that Neanderthals bred with Homo sapiens because you guys have like you know, well, depending on where you're from, but somewhere between two and five percent of Neanderthal DNA. Right which is classified as a different species. So in a scientific sense, they shouldn't be a different species, right? Because they can interbreed with Homo sapiens and produce viable offspring. By definition, they're the same species. So we don't know if it's a unique species by definition. You know, it's a, there's a, a very gray area between naming species and being accurate with that. Does that make sense? No, that's fine. No, I mean, that's a valid question. And I welcome you guys to ask these kind of questions. I mean, this class is not just here to, you know, I mean, we can make it where I just drudge through all the slides and you have to learn all this junk or whatever. But that, to me, would make a very lame class. So, you know, I want you guys to ask questions if you're interested. Some of this stuff I find fascinating. That's why I chose to do it as a job. Okay. So, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, and so the, you can see all these capitalized and italicized. All right, so I'm from Texas, and this is my favorite animal, the nine-banded armadillo. I'm just kidding. It's the liger. Uh, so I just want to go through, you know, why these scientific names you guys see. Um, and by the way, why do you think? Why do you need to know taxonomy? Who cares, right? And the answer is, I was in Singapore when SARS the SARS outbreak occurred. Do you, what is the first thing that you think that we wanted to do with the SARS virus? <laughs> Get away. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you guys are going to die. You know, we're the scientists, we're just going to leave you. Well, we got, yeah, so we want to get a sample, but why would we want a sample? Yeah, so we wanted to compare it to different viruses, so we sent the sample to a guy named Joe DeRisi at UCSF who had a chip called the pathogen chip. He had all of the known viruses and bacteria on this chip, and he could tell by the way that it inter by the way that the DNA matched, right? We talked about A's and G's, or A's and T's and G's and C's matching. So you can use DNA and match it by letter by letter like that. So the chip lit up as a coronavirus, but why would we want to do that? Why why would we want to find out what it's most closely related to? Because you would have the US how to Right. So it's the same thing, right? If if there was a new uh, bacteria that was like a flesh eating bacteria, you'd want to find out what kind of bacteria that was so you'd know what kind of antibiotics work against that bacteria, right? Certain antibiotics work against streptococcus versus Escherichia coli and so on and so versus anthrax. So, you know, you want to know because you can bet that if you have two streptococcus, they're probably going to enter, they're probably going to be susceptible to the same kind of antibiotic because they're closely related. Does that make sense? So that's why taxonomy is incredibly important in the medical field. You want to be able to classify stuff so that you know how to deal with it. Does that make sense, everyone? All right, so back to my favorite animal. This is what all of these things mean. The words may sound weird, but they're actually Greek and Latin, like I told you. So kingdom Animalia, it's an animal, right? Not a plant or a fungus or a single-celled organism. Chordata, what does that mean? It has a spinal cord, right? Uh, it's a mammal. That's its class. Have hair, give it. It's orders an author because it has a, a bone on it, a special like knot on its vertebrate that no other vertebrate has. So that's where that comes from. And then the family is Daisy Potidae, which is comes from the Greek word which means turtle rabbit. Genus is Daisypus, basically from the same thing, right? And then Novum, you know what that means? Novum nine. Synctus is 
band. So Days of Puss Novum Sinctus literally means nine banded turtle rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looks like that, right? Yeah. So Same thing with humans, right? Why are we called Homo sapiens? Because homide is for the Greek word that means human or first versus, I'm sorry, the Latin versus the Greek, which means self. And then sapien means wise. So basically, it literally means like the first wise being. It's pretty, pretty egocentric, isn't it? So your book talks about the six kingdom system that we have the U and the archaeobacteria. They make this as a its own kingdom or its own domain. But I told you guys we just lump all the bacteria together in Monera. So that's the only variation from your book. Any questions about that? All right. So how do we classify things? Well, we classify them basically. Uh, do they move or not? So if they move, we call them modal. If they don't move, we say they're sessile. Are they multicellular or unicellular, right? So what are you? Multicellular, multicellular right? Uh, are they prokaryotic or eukaryotic? And you guys, I think you know what that means. Uh, do they form colonies? Are they autotrophs? So auto means self and troph means food producing. So an autotroph is something that produces its own food. Do you produce your own food? I mean, you might in your kitchen, but you're not really like, go, you're not, it's not like you lay out in the sun and go, mm, I'm full, I'm going to go in now. You know, that's what a plant does. So an autotroph would be a plant, right, where fungus, they can't do that. So they would be a heterotroph. They digest, feed on the debris of other organisms. Uh, they're basically scavengers. and We kind of are too. You know, you know we sneak up on plants and dig them up while they're not looking. So we're heterotrophs too. So here's characteristics of the different kingdoms. The Monera, they're unicellular and they're prokaryotic, right? So if I said we went to Europa and we found a unicellular prokaryote, what would you classify it in? Monera, good. Examples are bacteria and blue-green algae, which they're not really algae, they're actually bacteria. They're called cyanobacteria. They, they call them, scientists originally called them algae because they didn't know of any bacteria that could do photosynthesis. That's why they got their, that designation. Hmm? Tomato, tomato, right? Depends on if you're British or not. You know, they spell things weird too, like color, gray. <laughs> Yeah, like I said, I'm going to I'm going to ask you questions like, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. I might ask you on the test like you you went to Europa and you found an organism that is an autotroph uh, that's multicellular and sessile. What kingdom would you put it in? And the answer is plants. Right? Or, you know, it was multicellular and it moved and it had specialized sense organs, what kingdom would you put it in? Animalia, right? So things like that you can expect on the test. So protists, mostly unicellular, eukaryotic. Some are colonial, but not most of them. Fungi are multicellular, eukaryotes, they're heterotrophs, and generally they don't move around, although there are some exceptions, like slime molds can move. Um, plants, Generally, you don't see plants walking around, right? So what are they, modal or sessile? Yeah. They're multicellular or unicellular? And, and they have cell walls made out of cellulose. And then animals are heterotrophs. Usually they can move and they have specialized sen sense organs, right? Like lions and tigers and bears. Any questions about taxonomy? All right, so the, like part of the study guide that I put on there is to kind of help you with the taxonomy part. Um, so there's some practice problems and some questions on there that you can answer. 
All right, so we're going to move on to the next thing, which is the scientific method or scientific process. You guys probably have done this all the time. Let's say you went home right now and you turn on the light switch what, and nothing happened. What would you do? Sit in the dark? Cry? <laughs> right, I mean, it could be a lot of stuff, right? So you're going to start asking questions, and the question you're going to ask is, why, why does my light work, right? You've already started down the path of the scientific method just by asking that question. And then the next thing that follows the question is you're going to form a hypothesis, which is an educated guess. If you didn't know how a light bulb worked, could you guess that it's the electricity that's not running to it? No. I mean, same thing with a flashlight, right? I know that a flashlight is made of that works with batteries and a bulb. But if I gave a flashlight to someone who lived in the Amazon and never saw humans before, you think they could form a hypothesis to fix the flashlight? No. So that's why it's an educated guess. You have to know something about how things work in order to make to to form possible causes of the situation, right? So let's say you you could say, well, maybe my light bulb burned out, right? Or maybe I didn't pay my electric bill, right? So you're going to go and make experiments, right? One of the experiments would be if you didn't think, if you thought it was a light bulb, would be go get another bulb, right? Put it in there and see if that works. That's a hypothesis, and you've just performed an experiment to test it. What if it doesn't come on? You're going to form another hypothesis, right? You know? Maybe, you know, or it could be as simple as it just got unplugged, right? So, you know, you're going to run through these things and you're going to keep testing it. You're going to keep running experiments. You're going to form new hypotheses and you're going to test those until you figure out what's wrong, right? That's how we solve problems in science. And we have to do controls. So let's just say, let's take something simple like a flashlight, right? Batteries, a light bulb, and there's a switch on there, something you know, that turns it on and off. But it's a pretty simple piece of equipment. So let's say that the flashlight didn't work. You want to know why it doesn't work, right? So let's say that your hypothesis was the batteries didn't work. So you go and you get batteries and you put it in there. Well, how do you know that those batteries aren't bad too? So in science, that's important, right? We call that a positive control. So you would need something that you knew that those batteries worked in, like a test meter or another flashlight, to say for sure that those batteries function properly. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. So controls are important. You could also just switch out the, the bulb and the batteries all at the same time. But what would that tell you? You might have fixed it, but did you, did you, did you solve the problem? So in science, we want to know what the problem is, not just to fix it, but to, to find out what's wrong with it so that in the future we kind of know what pathway to head down. All right, so that's the scientific method, and, and you know that's why I gave you guys that cricket assignment, which you, some of you have already done in Canvas. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll show you in a second after we finish this chapter. But there's a extra credit assignment that's worth 10 points on your first test to do the scientific method using the crickets. I think I went over it on the first day, but... Uh, it's just blinking at me. There's nothing I can do about it until it stops doing that. And I don't know why it's doing that. Like, I've taught in this room for 10 years and this has never happened to me. So maybe it's, you know, a poltergeist or something. Who knows? <laughs> you can't, we can't, so that's one of the limitations of that is you can only, we can only test things that can be measured, right? I can't measure, even though you see people running around doing those, you know, uh, Ghostbuster or whatever shows, like, you know, the equipment starts going crazy, and you, it's funny because I watch some of that because I, you know, my wife believes in all that, you know, uh, 
Long Island medium crap and stuff. But, you know, I watch these shows, and she's like, look, it's like that. Look at that thing. There's, there must be a ghost. And I'm like, they're standing right next to an electrical outlet. That's what's causing the electromagnetic interference. It's not that there's a ghost, you know. So it just, it, I just think it's funny. Yeah, right. Sorry, there's a, there's a draft. Anyway, sorry to be a skeptic. Uh, you never know. You know, it is science, so I could be proven wrong. You know, some ghost could walk out of the wall right now and say, hey, Lewis, guess what? You're wrong. And I'd be like, okay, I'm a scientist. I have to accept that thing. <laughs> so scientific method is basically, you know, you define the problem. Flashlight doesn't work. Ask a question. Why doesn't the flashlight work? You have to know how a flashlight works, right, in order to solve this. And then you form a hypothesis, educated, yes. Batteries are dead, right? And when you guys do the lab, you're going to do this for every single lab. Right, so you have to form a hypothesis and then test it because that's what science is like. So we replace the batteries, we're testing the hypothesis, and something's going to happen, right? Either it's going to work or it doesn't. If it works, you're going to be like, aha, it was the batteries. And if it doesn't work, you're going to be like, aha, it wasn't the batteries. So let's try something else. Right? Controls are important, right? We have to control all the other variables. When you do the cricket assignment, right? It, it, it talks about, you know, crickets chirp faster under certain conditions. Well, you know, if you're trying to find out if it's temperature or light, can you change the temperature and light at the same time? So you have to keep everything else constant and just vary one thing. Sometimes that's hard to do, especially when you're doing, like, studies on humans because they tend to do whatever they want. And you can't control them like you can lab animals. Uh, Variables are things that you vary, right? Temperature, light, humidity, you know, whatever. And then there's certain groups. So there's groups that get experimented on and groups that are not experimented on. You probably heard of this, like, you know, if I was doing a clinical trial and testing a new drug for, you know, heart disease or something like that, I would give one group the drug and the other group would get a placebo, which basically is a sugar pill. Because there's a real effect Believe it or not, there's a psychological effect that can cause people to feel better, uh, even though the placebo effect. It's a real effect, so you have to you have to do that sort of experiment to see. Yep, it's true. It's true. All right, so remember, uh, we can only test things that can be measured, right? So there may be a 14th dimension, but if you can't measure it, you know, then it, then you can't really do scientific testing on it. You know, there could have been Martians sending signals from Mars, you know, in the 1700s, and no one would ever know because we didn't have equipment that could measure radio waves back then. Maybe they'll develop some equipment that can see into the 14th dimension where the ghosts are that the Long Island medium can see. But I can't test that because there's no equipment that exists that can measure that. So that's, science is limited to what we can do. It has to be something that we can measure. And then scientists, you know, have to be able to critique each other's work, so that's why we publish stuff in scientific journals. Your textbook, believe it or not, no one's no one scrutinized that thing, so they could write whatever they want in it. But a journal, it would have to be peer reviewed and then published. All right. So here's the cricket assignment. I'm not sure if this link works or not, but I know it's in Canvas. I think I just locked up the computer. Oh, I can turn it on now.
so th there's a link in this in Canvas, and it's under assignments too. So you just click on this, and then enter your name, and then do the tutorial in the Cricut experiment. At the end, you'll get an award, and you can either submit that on Canvas, or you can bring it in with you, and I'll give you 10 extra credit points on your first exam, which I think is scheduled for October 2nd. All right, any questions about Chapter 1? All right, on to Chapter 2. Okay, so I'm, that's blinking. I can't turn it on. You guys will have to use the other screen. At least we have two of them. Um, so anyway, this chapter is basically chemistry. Uh, in order to understand biology, you have to understand chemistry because we are basically, the, the reason that we can exist is because of chemical reactions. So you need to know some basic chemistry. Uh, the first thing that's basic is that organisms are composed of matter. Matter is something that, that has mass and takes up space. Um, an element is a substance that can't be broken down any further um, at, by a chemical reaction. And so uh, there's the periodic table of the elements, which is over here. And so those are examples of things that are true elements. Um, there's 92 naturally occurring elements. A lot of periodic tables show things that aren't naturally occurring, uh, like doing the outlines. So this, somebody's like gone and written stuff on this periodic table. But the stuff that's purple, those are generally gases, and then there's things that are liquids at room temperature. Um, and then uh, these are not naturally occurring things. So they're outlining instead of some other. So this is a The periodic table is important because it tells you the properties of each of the elements. So the number above, that red number, that shows you, watch that one, will go up. Um, so above the H, right, you guys know what that H is? So that's hydrogen. That one tells you that it has one proton.
but you know it's not economically worth producing diamonds all right so any questions about elements all right so first two letters of their name but sometimes it's from Latin and Greek the compound is taking two of the elements and putting them together so you guys are probably used to one of the common elements which is sodium chloride right so it's Na Cl that's two elements stuck together right sodium is a, a metal right it's a if you took sodium metal and put it in water it would it blows up and chlorine is a deadly gas so you take an explosive metal and a deadly gas and you stick them together and what do you get deliciousness right so I mean does that make any sense the point is is that when you when you add things together you change their shape you change their chemical and physical properties completely no one would have ever thought of an explosive metal and a deadly gas put together would be so tasty but it is okay. um, life requires about 25 chemical elements so like I said we're generally going to be dealing with the chemical elements that are up higher on the periodic table um, four of those elements are the most abundant 96 percent of living things are carbon oxygen hydrogen and nitrogen and then the rest the four percent is generally phosphorus sulfur calcium and potassium and we'll talk about why later any questions all right time's up so i'll see you guys on thursday